Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a D.C. sports podcast, more specifically, a Washington Commanders podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. And this episode is the recap episode of the Commanders loss to the Seattle Seahawks on the road, 29 to 26, a very, very close game. I don't know that I would necessarily classify it as a heartbreaker. Again, the Seahawks were favored by six and a half points. We did jump out to an early lead. We're going to talk about the positives and the negatives of the game. And then we're going to talk about moving forward and the comment mailbag, as we always do. Um, and so without further ado, why don't we get into it? And KDOT, the positives from the game. Let's start with the good news. We're starting with, with the, the good game. news? Let's start with the good news. And then we'll get news. to the negatives after that. Go ahead. Um, Emmanuel Forbes wasn't on DK Metcalf. Oh! I thought about that too. I did think about that too. We'll get to the negatives in a moment in that regard, but go ahead. Yeah, because uh, yeah, well, there'll be a bunch of negatives as far as uh, some people when it comes to that shit. Fuck the refs. Uh, as far as the positives go, look, outcome of the game, exactly what we pretty much expected. Um, I know I nailed the spread, giving myself a little pat on the back. No, it, well deserved. I, I'm so fat, I can't really reach. I'm trying. The uh, I left this game feeling more positive than bad. I actually felt good after this loss, which is a weird thing to say. And it almost, I, I usually hate when people do that, but I think there's no doubt we got our quarterback. That's a fucking positive. That's a huge positive to me. We have our guy. Sam Howell is a dude that when you put it all out, he can make any throw. I think he's been pretty evident. He's not afraid, completely fearless in the position. For the most part. I mean, every once in a while, he gets sacked a little too many times. He gets a little shell shock. But it's a good – it's fine. This was his 11th start. They kept saying this is this this uh, this game. Is that right? Yeah. This dude has so much more to learn, and if he learns so much more, the sky's the limit. We have no idea what the ceiling is on this dude. There was some – hate to say it, but Mahomes-esque sort of shit happening in this game – when it comes to the other positive that I'm going to bring up, which is the Eric Bieniemy, I know that some people are going to criticize some of the play calling, and I do think that there is some criticism there. Um, and we'll get to that in the negatives. But the positive aspect is that there are some things that I've been asking from Eric Bieniemy as far as what it is he's doing to protect Sam Howell, especially when it comes to the run game. And you saw some elements of that here in this game. They ran under center more than they typically do, including that run in the fourth quarter that looked incredible at one point. And you're like, well, why aren't they doing this all game? Under center, they do 14-yard run from Robinson, 12-yard run from Robinson, 5-yard run from Gibson, 3-yard run or 2-yard run from Gibson. But even the 5 and the 2 yards put you at 3rd and 3. And 4 straight runs. 4 straight runs, right? So, like, you go all the way up until that point. I think we had, like, 10 runs, mm -hmm. period, up until that point in the game, which is just not enough to keep it balanced. But what I did appreciate was that he was – changing up the way that he's been running and even under uh, at a shotgun, which I still hate. And I think that under shotgun running, when it's the majority of what it, you you're telegraphing to the defense entirely too much of direction, the runs going, which is why it never usually works for us. Um, but even with that, there were a couple wrinkles in it. Sam Howell kept the ball on that fumble. Fumble's not good. Sam needs to learn more. And that comes with practice and experience, but that's a wrinkle I've been asking for. You need to keep the defense honest. Look, he had a hell of a lane to run through because no one's expecting it. Because every time that we show a run look, we know everyone knows where the ball's going. So if you can put put that run pass element to it, sky's the limit. And the only way for Sam Howe to get better at that is to do it more often. So then he knows, hey, just go down. Don't need to fight for the extra yards. Don't need anything. Maybe you need to protect the ball just a little bit more. You need to give him more experience in that realm. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that they were doing. Um, the idea of what Eric Bieniemy was doing as far as getting Brian Robinson and them involved in the pass game even more. Robinson had a hell of a show in the pass game. At some points, it looked like Robinson was the best player on the field. 
That's good. These are all good, positive things that you can look towards. And if we're looking at evaluating this season and going to be excited about next season, you're not worried about quarterback. And right now, if Brian Robinson is showing what he's doing with the limited scheme that we're doing with the run game and Antonio Gibson with the limited scheme that we're doing with the run game, there's talent here. There's Absolutely. Talent you can build off. Of. Yeah. And uh, on the subject of Sam Howell, like you said, we've got a guy. I think it's very clear as of right now, of course, the Miami Dolphins are on by, so they will not be playing, which means that Sam Howell is the leader in passing yards in the NFL right now, which is yep. through, you know, these 10 weeks. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing to be able to say your Washington commanders starting quarterback leads the NFL in passing yards. It's very, very cool. And it's only his 11th career start, as mentioned by KDOT. He showed an ability to improvise today. So that first touchdown to Brian Robinson, he rolls left, allows the defense to come toward him. They had to make a decision. And from there, a little flick of the wrist, Brian Robinson does the rest from there. Fabulous. In fact, we hit that play twice and it went very, very far both times. Brian Robinson actually ended up being the leading receiver today. Six catches, 119 yards and a touchdown. The second leading receiver, Antonio Gibson, five catches, 42 yards, and a touchdown. k I will tell you this. I want to run the ball. You know that. I know that. We've talked about it a whole lot. If we are going to get the running backs involved in the receiving game like this, it doesn't have to be exactly like this, obviously, but if we're going to, and we're going to run those little quick screens and just those quick throws off the line, I'm be- it's beginning to grow on me a little bit. I would, of course, like to see more because I'm of the mindset that football, being as physical a sport as it is, you can wear a defense down, especially on the line. But if it's going to look like this, Sam Howell, this is at Seattle. This is one of the hardest places to play. Mm -hmm. 29 to 44, 312 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. He did have the fumble. Yes, He, he is him to me. And he has shown a clutch gene. That throw to Deami Brown over two defenders in a clutch situation, Deami scores. Like, then you go back to Philadelphia, the throw to Dotson. Like, he's got something. And there are a lot of positives, too. This is a huge revelation. And may it continue, right? There's still some more time to see what happens. Maybe he regresses tremendously. I don't see that occurring at this point. I think we can all feel very confident in him. Uh, So that's a positive. The running backs getting involved in the receiving game, a positive would like Jahan Dotson to have more than the one target for, or two targets rather, excuse me, for zero catches, zero yards, et cetera. But on offense, we have a guy and that's great. I also thought Jamin Davis had a particularly good game on the defensive side of things. Let us in tackles, had a couple nice solo tackles as well. Six in all. Um, including a couple of tackles for loss. So I thought Javon Davis in particular was very good. Uh, why don't we go ahead and jump over to the negatives? Because one of the negatives in particular I want to begin with is Emmanuel Forbes should not have been ejected. I don't know how you make that call. Uh, Emmanuel Forbes himself tweeted uh, earlier that there have been worse hits this season, and he's 100% correct. It was crazy. Um, especially because Lockett came back in almost immediately, ended up going for eight catches, 92 yards, a touchdown at one point, pointed at like David May. Like he was fine. To it was it was as bad a call as I've seen. The let me take a step back. The penalty itself was the correct call. The ejection yes. was way over the top. Way over the top. And it forced St. Juice, who I actually thought had a really nice game up until the second half where it just started to get to him. Guarding DK Metcalf, that, that's very, very tough. We talked about it beforehand. But early on in the game, St. Juice was doing well, but just target after target after target after target. They just started to overwork the guy. And that's what's going to happen when you lose one of your corners for the game. Um, yeah, Emmanuel Forbes getting ejected, a big negative. Name some other ones and pile on to that one because it was an egregious decision. Well, I'd like to segue through the stuff that you did and like draw parallels to the negative or like sure. how, but um, I've lost track of how many. The um, I, I went on a bit of a rant. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. You did great. I, I'm I'm one to rant. The um, all right. So starting at the end, work my way forward. 
Yes, Emmanuel Forbes' ejection was absolutely egregious. You talk about a dude that weighed half as half as much as Tyler Lockett. Um <laughs> that has absolutely no history of doing this, doing anything, and then you just bounce his ass. It was a football. What play. the fuck was that? Like it was ridiculous. Now, that also being said, I don't agree the St. Juice had a good game at any different point in the game. I think um, we remember the end a whole lot more. I'm looking at the whole game. And the thing is, okay. the, the, the whole game to me is that Seattle was wearing us down as much as it mm-hmm. wasn't that they were, like, taking long shots or anything. They had some pretty long drives, like, even when they were getting the field goals going, right? Um, the The thing for me is that, like, but I don't – until you're talking about what happened in the fourth quarter with St. Juiced, just uh, – Oh, it was tough in the fourth quarter, for sure. completely fucking whiffs. It's just, holy shit. What happened to his mentals? What Who I blame more than anyone is Jack Del Rio, leaving him one-on-one on a guy that was clearly not working. Like, what are you doing? Like, But I think it was working ad- early on. I think it was working early on. And Gino was contributing to that with some inaccurate passes. That's, that's my point. That's my yeah. point. The defense never dictates. Mm. The defense is there to hope that the offense fucks it up. It's not because of us. There it's I rarely agree. ever because of us. There I agree. So like it's so that's where this vanilla ass 2002 <laughs> defense we're running is trash. Like Chase Young and Montez Sweat. No, I don't see a difference. <laughs> I don't fucking see any difference. I don't see that we tremendously fell off or got better. I don't give a shit who you got better. Michael Parsons, Sauce Gar- I don't give a fuck who you have on that defense. They're not going to get the best out of them. Period. I just, they, they're not with this dude. To me, the biggest negative is fire his ass. <laughs> fire him. I don't like calling for people's jobs. I, I, there's a human element to the game that I never want to, I, I never want to disrespect. Understood. Yeah. Fire him. <laughs> I, I, I I'm get over it. it. But yeah, I'm well, fucking over it. I think a lot of fans are over it, Kate. I think you speak for a lot of fans over there. And, you Who's know, the I, first I, person you've heard fucking rail against Jack Del Rio in this defense. Who's the first you? Who's the first person you know has been talking ad nauseum about Jack Del Rio? You have been talking for about years. Him. For years. I've been fucking tired. Okay. I'm at the front of this goddamn line. Oh, yeah, anybody else saw the chat? It's been me. Okay. I have the fucking banner. Fire his ass. It's I'm over it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you're not going to find me disagreeing over here. Um, it's fucking ridiculous. Now the other stuff, like like this. Uh, we, um, as far as some of the negative stuff, like even offensively, I give you credit as far as um, what I was saying as far as the breakdown of like, what you were saying in the sense that on your positive aspect, I'm going to change this to a negative. You were talking about how um, you could get used to them doing this if they're distributing the ball to the running backs the way they are as far as the lack of running game. Yeah. I disagree wholeheartedly. And okay. the reason I disagree wholeheartedly is yes, you can do product. They are making it so much harder for themselves by doing it this way. And the Seattle defense is like the, the, the defensive backs, the entire game, they were basically threatening Sam Howe to throw the ball. And he was doing it anyway. Right. But the, but the idea of the, why he was giving it to the running backs was because there were none of the other guys open. He didn't yeah, really but we've already option. talked about the Seattle secondary being very, very good. No, we I get, talked I, about, right. But, so but when that's po- going to happen and uh-huh. should the running backs end up getting involved and being capable of getting involved, which they showed today, I'm yeah. saying if that were to continue, those are just another weapon or two in the case of Robinson and Gibson moving forward. I'm not saying this is the game plan moving forward, but, but I, nice I, I to know it. that we can. Yeah, it's nice to know what we've talked about this. We have dudes that are versatile. Yes, it's great. Mm-hmm. But the idea is you need to have variety within the offense itself and stick to a variety of things in order to make everything easier. Yeah, no, there we agree. So like the the idea I did the so I rewatched the game up until they up until they ran uh, the four times in a row. I did a uh, I did a I counted all the times they uh, ran offensive plays under center compared to in shotgun. So under center, up until that point, they had five or sorry, four run plays under center and three pass plays. So that's under center. Okay. Out of shotgun, four runs, 22 dropbacks. Mm-hmm. Crazy numbers. The idea is if you're trying to get things by a defense, right, you've got to have some unpredictability to what it is you're doing to some degree. Okay. I just think there needs to be more variety of things happening under center because the idea as far as from a running standpoint, when I do the breakdown as far as those numbers, right, 
Right. The times that we ran under center compared to the times we ran at a shotgun, night and day. Sure. Was that over the course of a certain number of quarters or was that the whole game? Because 22 up until the fourth and... quarter. Okay, the fourth cool. Quarter. Yeah, I was going to say, because there are 18 additional dropbacks after that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. up until the fourth quarter. But that's okay. when you're two minute offense. They're trying to do Understood. stuff. And that, so like, I don't even want to yeah. count that. They, to Fair me, enough. this was regular game flow. Okay. Quarters one to three. Right. So regular game flow up until the point where I was like, oh, shit, he's doing that. But once again, I, I gave him credit for there are certain things that he's introducing to shotgun that are adding some wrinkles to it if he's going to maintain this and make it things easier. He mm-hmm. just is yet. I've yet to see Eric Bieniemy put it all together. I've yet to see him. Um, it, 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 he's still learning, and I know that this is a whole process and everything. But I still, to me, there needs to be more variety. There needs to be when he when Sam Howell's doing things outside the pocket. Those need to be more designed. There were a couple that I that looked really designed as far as him rolling out, which I was like happy to see. But th- there mm-hmm. needs to be more of that, and I think there needs to be more of that from under center. The the you need to get Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson and stuff involved. Mm-hmm. If the if the secondary is shutting down things to a certain degree, there are other ways to get those guys involved. You have to get the ball in the hands of your playmakers. Of course, absolutely. And again, Dotson zero catches today. Terry pretty quiet day, four catches, thirty three yards. You got Reek and you got Devin Witherspoon, you got Jamal Adams, Julia. Love. Like it it is a solid secondary, but you still need to be able to perform against any secondary. Of course. Of course, well, the, the other thing that the other thing that Seattle was doing was, like I said, they were begging Washington to run the ball. But the thing that Washington was doing is up until that point in the fourth quarter, when they're running out of shotgun, if you're running, the defense knows exactly where the ball is going. If mm-hmm. the defense knows exactly where the ball is going, it becomes ineffective. Running the football and running it effectively does a lot of things as far as the time of possession, does a lot mm-hmm. of things as far as uh, getting the offense. Oh, historically, we up. know that, of course. Does yeah. a lot of things as far as having the wide receivers not be fucking gassed every goddamn time they're running fucking out right. Like, there's mm-hmm. there's so many things that happen when it comes to completing the run game. So that's something that I need to see them do a better job of. Yeah. Other negatives. Um, I agree with Ron Rivera not going for two. Yeah. That's not a negative. I hate his explanation because oh, I hate him go. explaining anything. He just doesn't sound right explaining it. Like, as much as I agree with him, like, what happened? What? They had too much time left? What? Well, what? no, actually, so funnily enough, there, I, I actually agreed with him. Please uh, break because, it down to me. Break it down to me. So, okay. Uh, I think of the situation where, le- okay, you go for two. You're either winning or losing at the end of that play, right? You're down one or you're up one. You're yeah. down one. You all of a sudden need to recover an onside kick. You've already burned two timeouts. That could just be the ball game right there. If you go up one, this is where it gets interesting. Seattle, by definition, needs to be aggressive versus with 52 seconds left, they maybe choose not to. Maybe they have one negative play. They don't end up being aggressive. And I can see a situation where he doesn't trust the defense and goes, okay, maybe just maybe we get one negative play on them. They play conservative. We go to overtime. We can get the ball first. This is very different from when we were against Philadelphia and there were zero seconds left on the clock. Because there was no opportunity for Philadelphia to respond if we were to have scored. So it's Game's just over. based on you thinking that they would be more aggressive than not because of the time that was left. Absolutely. 52 seconds with those timeouts. Yes, you can be more aggressive. So even if you take a negative play, you can still continue to be aggressive as Seattle. I don't think our defense does well in that situation. But even if you go for two, Seattle still just needs a field goal to win it. Right. But if you end up, let's say the first play is a sack, for example, like something like that. If the first play is a sack or they run the ball first play, no game, one but yard. They also still have two timeouts, right? Yeah, they do. But the point is that they immediately, if you go up one, are being aggressive from the get go. Will we say that they were aggressive anyway? I'm not sure that they actually would have been. I don't think that no, they no, were. were they. I'm not sure they were. Hmm. Because the first two plays, meh, right? They weren't. But then they end up getting the third down, whatever. It played out the way it did. But I don't mind not going for two in that situation. I don't either. I, I don't mind the explanation. Either I did. Because I, yeah, maybe it's. I was, I was actually. I was actually all right with it. I was actually okay. all right with that explanation. I will also say that a lot of what happened as far as the explanation rubbing me the wrong way is when we bungled the timeout situation. Um, <laughs> yeah, fair. The timeout at 148. It, uh, <laughs> 148 left to take the timeout in the third and 10 after there was a delay anyway. And then they call the second time after it wasn't named didn't get out of bounds. 
but they waste 10 seconds in the process of doing that too. Just do better, guys. Yeah, certainly. Um, one more quick positive before we oh, go to David the Mayo sucks. Yeah, well, I mean, we know linebackers not always been exactly a position of strength uh, recently. Uh, one final positive, Tressway was magnificent in terms of handling those snaps oh, uh, on special teams. Yeah. I mean, even the first. So I think a lot of people look at Joey Sly and be like, how on earth did you miss that extra point? That was a high snap, too. It went high snaps matter uh, just for so the much. casual fan or, you know, maybe someone that doesn't pay as much attention to it, because when that occurs, it doesn't give you the opportunity to rotate the ball where it needs to be. And when that occurs, you're able to have a clean kick. If you are not able to rotate the ball accordingly, you can get some really funky movement that's out of the control of the kicker. So you go, Joey Sly, how'd you miss? That's how. It starts from the snap. And that yep. needs to be 100% clear. Um, so Tressway, you played great as a snapper as well as a butter. Just fabulous. Anyway. Cameron um, Cheese, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's we been a problem all year. It has been a problem all year, and I'm curious to see if we end up addressing it at some point. Uh, two comments, beginning with Spencer Brudig, former co-host of the show, and recently married. Congratulations, Spencer. Congrats, Spence. Two words and three Roman numerals. Kenneth Walker the third, who did have 19 Massive carries point. for 63 yards and just the one catch. However, it was for Massive. 64 yards and a touchdown. So Kenneth Walker the third had himself a day. Spencer, you had yourself a comment. Really appreciate that. And then Blood Clot. Shout out Blood Clot. KDOT, I went to school in Savannah for three years before SCAD, S-C-A-D, uh, was as big as it is now. I've SCAD. Been, SCAD. It's just SCAD? Not even SCAD. It's just SCAD. SCAD. The What's Savannah SCAD? I haven't College. Heard. Savannah College of Arts and Design. Art and Design. Known as SCAD. My apologies, Blood Clot. Uh, that city holds a special place in my heart. One of my favorite cities, but I too want to move to Seattle or in the Washington area when I retire. Savannah Which College is- of Art and Design. Got it. Thank you for that. And thank you for the comment, Blood Clot. And this Savannah's was awesome. District Divided, DC Sports Podcast, more specifically a Washington Commanders podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. Comment as you always do in KDOT. Share this shit. Share this shit. Um, moving forward, let's see if we can somehow have ourselves a season. We do play the New York Giants, who are currently without Daniel Jones, without Terod Taylor. We are at home. We need to win that game. If we yeah. don't, very, very interesting conversation. Danny DeVito at quarterback. Him. Yeah. Danny DeVito. Um, we will see you guys Friday, 2 p.m. as we always do. Until then, take it easy. We got our quarterback. In D.C., we're just hoping that you listen. Mm-hmm.